At the heart of quantum mechanics lies the deep underlying roots of mathematics. Linear algebra is no doubt an important subject. However, why and how linear algebra and its components play an important role in understanding quantum physics? Why and how identity matrix, unitary matrix comes into the realm of quantum physics? What is quantum measurement and how the quantum operation helps us to reveal a new world of physics? In this video, we are going to look into that and take a step back also, if required, to brush up some concepts of linear algebra as it is the pivotal force to understand the quantum world. My name is Shonak and you are watching this video on my channel and we are continuing with the series of videos on mathematics of quantum physics where we are looking into quantum operations and quantum measurement today. Before we go ahead and start with today's video, here is a quick recap on whatever we have learned because in case you have missed some of them you won't uh, lament because here is a quick recap of what we have learned so in the last video we started with the second postulate of quantum physics and we dealt with is what is called a bonds rule and what actually is a bonds rule and how does it help in quantum measurement we also looked into the original paper of Max Born, why it is important and the uh, implication in terms of uh, its importance and why historically it is considered to be very important. We also looked into what is called a wave function, where exactly is the particle uh, by magnitude. Uh, the magnitude squared of the wave function actually gives us the probability density and uh, it deals with degrees of freedom, etc. We also looked into what is called a wave function collapse and its measurement I have demonstrated with various uh, wave function states into 1, 2 and 6 and we also learned what is probabilism that in two different bases which yields a probabilistic measure. We ended last video with uh, what is called an alternative methods of quantum measurement and I showed you that if you are using two different methods in yielding the same, uh, in doing the same quantum measurement, ultimately it leads to the same uh, result which was 1 by 2. Now this quantum measurement which leads to uh, the same result has got uh, important uh, implications in terms of quantum physics. What is that? We would be dealing with that today. But before that, here is a quick recap once more on what do we mean by quantum measurement by the first and the second method. Now suppose we have a quantum system which is this one psi and we have an orthonormal basis starting from phi 1, phi 2 and it goes up to phi n. Then we can explicitly write something as this. This we have dealt in the earlier lecture. You can find it in my playlist. I have given it in the I button also. So the probability at which the phi I measures is the probability of I C I squared. And this is called basically the first method. Now in spite of this first method, we adopted another method and we can always write a state psi and an orthonormal basis phi 1 to phi n and we can explicitly write this term as this. And as we have learned that using the bonds rule, we get the probability measurement of phi i as this, which ultimately leads to this and ultimately leads to this. Now, this is a kind of a, uh, you know, writing the state of vectors in an explicit manner. You can uh, later check up with this part. Now, what is important over here is that since these is an orthonormal basis, all the inner products are zero except with this one. So from there we automatically get that uh, uh, this would be equals to ci squared second method and here you see that the first method also gave the first uh, uh, result and the second method also provides the same result. Now why it is important what I am trying to tell is that it suggests that if the results are same then uh, the underlying physics is absolutely correct. And if what it also tells is that it, if the predicted probabilities from both calculation match with the experimental results, that means it provides a strong evidence for the accuracy of your approach. That means because both of them gives the same result, which was half, you can look into the first video, so it gives you actually the same result. Now, I want to demonstrate it with a very, very simple example. I mean to say how this method actually leads to the same result. I want to demonstrate that. Now, let us take a quantum state, something like this, which has uh, the question is that what is the probability of measuring it in the disk state? So, we will use this rule, simple, the first method, and using the further calculations and squaring, we will get into this. 
and we know that the modulus of z squared will ultimately give this and this is what is the result so we get 1 by 2 as the first method so you can just take a note you can pause the video right now and take a note that using the first method we get a result which is 1 by 2 now we already know that plus and this minus these two states forms an orthonormal basis which means this one and this one so uh, the 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 psi would yield into this and by further calculation we get this 1 plus i by 2 and 1 minus i by 2 and the probability of measuring in this plus state is actually this and by further calculation we get this now you see that the first method and the second method both of them are giving the same result this is the first method this is the same uh, second method now the question from here what rises is that this is this is all okay it is giving the same result now that from here what we come to know is that quantum states must be unit vectors this is basically the i would say the conclusion that we draw from uh, getting the first and the second method the question is that why why quantum states must be unit vectors and that is what i'm going to explore in the next part of the video why quantum states are unit vectors now uh, this is pretty simple i won't go into the mathematical calculation first of all there is something which is called a normalization principle that means we try to get something that the total probability of all possible outcomes sums to one and that is reason that is the reason quantum vectors are unit vectors which will result one the second reason is probability interpretation that means if i square the magnitude of the probability amplitude it corresponds to the probability density and this probability density gives us a probability of finding the particle in a specific state also there is something important which is called the superposition principle and what does it say it says that normalized state vectors ensure that the coefficient in this combination present probability amplitudes obviously and it's maintained the integrity of probabilities so as we know that quantum states can exist in superposition representing a combination of multiple states so a normalized state obviously uh, would give us a better integrity in terms of probabilities now there is another thing which is called a unitary evolution a unitary evolution means that as we know that quantum evolution or how a system rather i would say how a system evolves is guided and governed by schrodinger equation or unitary operators so starting with a normalized state evolution under unitary transformation ensures that subsequent states remain normalized now if it is not normalized if it is not normalized what it would result to we are not discussing but obviously it would result into infinities and further problems and finally retaining the physical state which we are going to see now is that all vectors are always not pointing in the same direction so multiplying state vector by constant value which is 1 does not change the physical state it's a kind of a you can say it is a kind of a tensor kind of a concept where we know that it won't change and uh, multiplying by the value of 1 will give the same nature of the state so obviously the mathematics the physics and the entire uh, game becomes quite important so this is the reason that why quantum states are unit vectors now if we write our quantum state uh, using any orthonormal basis that means from c1 phi1 c2 phi2 up to cn phi n then obviously we can write psi as this one which we are just squaring it and ci square will definitely be is the probability of measuring the state phi in the state phi1 now as because our measurement must give us something then the sum of probabilities must be 1 and that is because we need unit vectors i hope this part is clear because ci square is the probability of measuring the state or which state psi in the state which one what is the state the state is phi i and it can go up to i so then the norm of a quantum state is simply uh, uh, basically the uh, me measurement of the probability and since our measurement gives us something that the sum of the probabilities must be one so there is a need and that is the reason that we need a unit vector now once we have understood why quantum states are unit vectors we go to the next part which are called quantum operations and what do we mean by quantum operation is that so far we have learned how to calculate the measurement probability given the state of a system we know that but how do we create the system 
in other words is it possible that given a, fair, um, a kind of a initial state it is it can be transformed to any other states the answer is definitely a big yes and the mathematical representation of this is known as quantum operation now here is a postulate quantum operators are represented by unitary operators on the hilbert space again unitary operators unit vectors so you can see quite a good relationship between each other so we will start one by one to understand what it is so first part tells that a quantum operation transforms a quantum state to another quantum state from there it leads that the norm of the vector is preserved obviously otherwise how do we do the measurement then we come to this conclusion that the mathematical representation of any quantum operation therefore can be represented by unitary matrix why because the postulate itself says that quantum op operations are represented by unitary operators on the hilbert space so a quantum operation can transfer into any quantum state the norm of a vector is preserved so that the calculations are easier and the mathematical representations of any quantum operator can be represented by unitary matrix and any unitary matrix represents a possible quantum operation this is the i mean to say this is the chain this is the sequence now because we are dealing with lot of unitary and identity matrix the question is that we will we will just go back as i have told in the beginning of the video just to make a quick brush up on what is the identity matrix and what is a unitary matrix so in linear algebra uh, the identity matrix if i consider to be a size of n is the n times n square matrix with ones on the main diagonal and zero everywhere it is pretty simple you have done it in your school days identity matrix is denoted either by i or i sub n so here is identity matrix i2 i3 and so on and here if i diagonalize you see 1 1 1 1 1 1 1 1 and the rest of the part are zero so but one thing is very important why we are dealing with unitary matrix because it has got a property and the property is that when the identity matrix represents a geometric transformation again the object remains unchanged by the transformation and because it remains unchanged the quantum operations obviously becomes easier because we retain the vector which we have just seen in the few minutes earlier in the video so those who are doing into general theory of relativity can think that of a train tensor right because in tensor also when the coordinates are changing when we are moving from uh, you know a flat space to a curved space or different types of manifold there also the measurement is the same so this is the definition of identity matrix it is analogous to multiplying the number by 1 which gives the same thing now we come to what which is called a unitary matrix so in linear algebra what it is called an invertible complex square matrix is unitary if its matrix inverse and its conjugate transport is this this one u star u equals to u u star which should be equal to 1 so in 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 quantum physics the conjugate transport is referred to as the hermitian adjoint of a matrix if you can go back to my uh, channel physics for students i have made a very good video on this hermitian matrix and other things you can look into it and it is denoted not always by a star by a dagger so the equation can be written as this so these this this these are all basically called unitary matrices and the properties actually applies here now also there is another important property of unitary matrices and it says that if the same matrix u is applied to two vectors v1 and v2 so if i'm ap applying the um, unitary matrix u on a vector v1 and v2 it means w1 equals to u times v1 will be and w times u2 u times v2 will be equal to this one and if i go i have not shown the calculation it will be equals to v1 dot v2 so uh, the, it would be uh, ultimately it would lead to w1 dot w2 will be equal to v1 dot v2 and this is something which is something like this and the and a, you can further write is a sigma and these are what i will just show you these are called pauli matrices named after the famous uh, physicist wolfgang pauli so it is a set of a specialized matrix it is a 2 by 2 matrix that are hermitian involutory and unitary so on the top x y z these are all um, uh, you know pauli matrices but Uh, to be a uh, stricter on the mathematical language it is not written as x y z it is written as sigma now there is another quantum operation which is called uh, adamar uh, or hadamard matrix and this looks like this it is called adamard matrix and it is named after the famous french physicist 
Jacques Salomon Adamar, who was a French mathematician and did a major contributor in terms of complex analysis, etc. Now, this Adamar matrix, the Pauli matrices, these are all quantum operation. Now, let us see an example that can we, uh, can we, uh, you know, perform or do this operation with the state x on state one, z on x on the state plus, and h on state one. So, nothing to worry about. What we will do is that we are just going to do the calculations by multiplying the matrices. So, here you see, uh, now, how this quantum state represents 0, 1 and 1, 0. I hope you know. If you don't, then you can put it up in the comment box. I will make a separate video on this. And this would lead to this. Again, Z, because it has got plus, it has got a quantum state of this. And it would lead to this. And this is applied to this. Now, you can also apply the Adamer mat matrix on 1, plus and minus, And I will show you how this is. And I will show you in the next video. So, that's all for today's video. I just showed you uh, what are actually quantum operations, the meaning that it would result to the same, and most importantly, why quantum uh, states are unit vectors. And now you can understand that by multiplying by 1, etc., how it helps to maintain the same physical understanding and the same physical measurement. That's all for today's video. So I would immensely thank you for watching and taking up time to watch this video. If you have liked this video, please click on the subscribe button and click on the bell icon to get all the notification from Physics for Students. You can always contact me at this email ID and this is my other channel on General Theory of Relativity. You can subscribe and if you want, you can follow me on my Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram and Twitter account. Physics for Students will be soon back with more interesting and fun-filled videos. But till then, goodbye.